This is a presentation about evidence-based planning of clinical trials and living network meta-analysis. The presentation is partly based on work done by Adriani Nicolacopoulou and other colleagues at the Universities of Ioannina and Bern. There is no longer need to introduce network meta-analysis. The number of network meta-analysis published each year increases exponentially. More than 450 networks with at least four treatments have been published in the medical literature. Their critical appraisal revealed that the quality of methods and their reporting are considerably improving. The reporting of network meta-analysis is expected to improve further as the PRISMA statement has been published only last year. The percentage of articles that do clearly state that the transitivity assumption is likely to hold is increasing with time, although it remains low. Reporting of statistical methods is already satisfactory and the percentage of articles that present all pairwise treatment effects is also increasing. More importantly, Articles published more recently do employ appropriate methods to evaluate the assumption of consistency. Network meta-analysis has also entered the living systematic reviews world. Crecky and colleagues have initiated a living network meta-analysis for the second-line treatments for non-small cell lung cancer. Most of you are probably aware that members of the Cochrane Collaboration have come up with a three steps decision flowchart to decide how to prioritize updating of reviews. The charts by Garner and Takwonki consider, among others, the availability of new studies to decide whether further updating is needed. I was wondering whether at this point we miss an opportunity. Can we actively influence the production of new studies instead of passively waiting for them to get published? We all agree that new trials should be funded and designed only after considering the existing evidence, and research waste has become the new buzzword. But does this really happen in real world? Well, empirical evidence is rather discouraging. The use of meta-analysis in designing future studies ranges from 33 to 11%, and the use of meta-analysis to calculate the sample size in a new study ranges from 1% to 20%. These observations motivated a framework for planning clinical research in order to strengthen the existing evidence body towards provide conclusive results about treatment effects so that professionals and consumers of healthcare interventions can ascertain whether those effects outweigh risk, cost and inconvenience. Leaving network meta-analysis could take their lives in their hands and make specific suggestions about what sort of studies are needed and with what sample size. The framework starts with deciding whether the existing network meta-analysis provides a conclusive answer. If not, then we need to decide whether it makes sense to design future studies. In the case of large heterogeneity, even a very large study would not improve power much. Planning several small studies is more useful in this context, but even then the aim of further research should be directed towards understanding heterogeneity rather than trying to improve precision in the existing evidence. If planning a future study is deemed appropriate, then we need to decide which treatment comparison should be evaluated in a future study and with what sample size. Once the results of this study are available, then the network could be updated, including any other studies that have become available in the meantime. Our framework assumes that we have a consistent network. It assumes also that residual heterogeneity is low and that the research question will remain important for the time needed to complete the new study. It operates in the absence of new studies and decides whether a network meta-analysis can be classified as conclusive or open requiring further studies. Then, a new study can be planned to help us understand heterogeneity, improve credibility of the evidence by reducing the total risk of bias or improve precision. 
Later in the presentation, I will show you an example about a new study planned to improve precision of the meta-analysis. We are still working on the other two aims. The first step in our framework was to decide whether the existing evidence is conclusive. Because we do this in order to decide whether future data should be collected or not, we need to control type 1 error. We have extended the sequential meta-analysis method for the case of network meta-analysis. Consider the example of bare metal stands being compared with coronary artery bypass graft with respect to a composite outcome. With only five studies, the power is not enough to show any relative advantage of bypass grafting. But what would happen if we include studies that compare these two interventions with drug eluting stands? On the right hand side is the stopping framework for the meta analysis and on the left hand side for network meta analysis. They both focus on the comparison bare metal stands versus coronary artery bypass graft. Studies are ordered by time of publication and are synthesized cumulatively. On the horizontal axis is the amount of information accumulated with the addition of each study and on the vertical axis the z-score from each cumulative meta-analysis is presented. The boundaries are computed using the alpha spending functions. As soon as the cumulative process crosses the boundaries, we could stop and declare that we have a conclusive result. You see that for the case of simple pairwise meta-analysis, we don't have a conclusive advantage of the bypass crafting, whereas indirect evidence in the network suggests that, indeed, coronary artery bypass crafting is more effective than bare metal stents in reducing the risk of the composite outcome. A similar picture is obtained for the ranking of the treatments. The sucra values are very close in the beginning of the network. Sucra close to 50% suggests similar outcomes for the three interventions. As we add more studies, the advantage of coronary artery bypass graft becomes more clear. A similar observation for the comparison of haloperidol to olanzapine for patients diagnosed with schizophrenia with respect to improvement in symptoms. The 11 direct studies are not enough but we could add all the data via many other active comparators or placebo. This graph shows the stopping framework but using repeated confidence intervals instead of the stopping boundaries. The point estimates are the means of the cumulative meta-analysis or network meta-analysis, the solid lines, the naive confidence intervals, and the dashed extensions, they are the repeated confidence intervals adjusted for repetitive testing for significance. Network meta-analysis enables us to conclude that olanzapine has an advantage over haloperidol. We have been collecting all network meta-analysis published since 2013 with at least five treatments and a 10-year study publication span. From its network meta-analysis, we have selected the comparison most relevant to guidelines development and we compared conclusiveness using sequential monitoring. 5 in 31 comparisons are conclusive only if indirect evidence from the network is included. This suggests that we are potentially missing some conclusive evidence if we focus just on the pairwise studies. Assuming that evidence is not conclusive, we need to plan a future study. If this is unrealistic, I think reviews should state in their conclusions more explicitly what is needed to render the existing evidence conclusive. Andriani has been extending the idea of conditional power to make sample size calculations. In this context, we don't design a study to be a standalone experiment and be powered on its own, but the, we want it to add power to the existing body of evidence. 
Consider the triangular network comparing radiofrequency ablation, ethanol injection and acetic acid injection in patients with hepatocellular carcinoma. Radiofrequency ablation is better than ethanol injection, but because it requires intravenous sedation and has major complications, we might want to exclude the minimum worthwhile effect before recommend this treatment. The worthwhile odds ratio for that comparison has been set, say, at 0 0.7. Similarly, acetic acid injection requires fewer sessions, so conclusiveness is achieved with an odds ratio that is smaller than, say, 1.1. So, we do not have conclusive evidence as both worthwhile effects are included in the confidence intervals. And the question is, what is the sample size needed to improve precision so that when the new study is added to the existing network meta-analysis, the two worthwhile effects are excluded? There are several possible scenarios to consider. One might want to design a radiofrequency ablation versus ethanol injection trial, or an acetic acid injection versus ethanol injection trial, or both types of studies, or a three arm trial. Minimizing the required sample size over all possible scenarios, we calculated that the most efficient design is the three arm trial with the sample size that you see on the screen. This approach can be used also to inform us about the types of studies that are inefficient to plan. In a network of four treatments for heavy menstrual bleeding, hysterectomy had the lowest satisfaction rates, but no important differences have been detected between Mirena or first and second generation endometrial destruction techniques. Hysterectomy comes as the most effective treatment, but it is radical and it is only connected to first generation endometrial destruction. One might think that a Mirena versus hysterectomy study might be desirable because it will close a loop and it involves an effective and the least invasive treatments. But estimation of the conditional power for the network meta-analysis shows that such a study would be informative for the Mirena versus hysterectomy comparison, but would not add much power to any of the other comparisons. So, unless you really want to know about the Mirena versus hysterectomy comparison, you should not plan such a study to improve precision in the entire network. Undertaking underpowered trials has been described as unethical if carried out in the absence of explicit plans for obtaining a definitive answer. Studies planned within active living systematic reviews would be underpowered, but at the same time they will ensure a powerful and timely evidence synthesis. Active living systematic reviews can reduce risk by lowering the number of patients needed to randomize, by providing optimal options for the comparator's arm, and by providing more ethical options for the randomization ratio. They can also speed up conclusiveness for key research questions. But of course, the suggested approach needs a credible starting point. A network where the assumption of transitivity is defendable and it is expected to remain so even with the introduction of new competing interventions and studies. Thank you very much.